I spent almost two months or a bit more than two months on the German research vessel Sonne on a cruise that was organized by Jürgen Köpke. Uh, Henry was also part of that. And uh, we sailed back from 45 degrees south to 53 degrees north. So that was plenty of time to get to know each other. Um, and during that time, we had the pleasure of uh, learning Daniela's expertise, which is centered around the petrology and geochemistry of the sub-oceanic mantle and mid-ocean bridge vessels. And Daniela, I'd like to introduce him briefly, um, started his PhD or did his PhD in Bologna uh, with uh, under Professor Bonatti, which is also mentioned as a co-author on his uh, slide here. He then started doing his postdoc uh, in France and had several places in France he stayed in, uh, part of which was the IPGP in Paris um, until 2014. And in 2014, he got an associate professorship in petrology and petrography at the University of Modena in Italy, where he's hosted now. And he will provide a talk today on the importance of long temporal series to unravel the source control on the thickness and composition of the oceanic crust. Uh, before Daniela gets started, I'd like to ask you to all switch off your videos to preserve bandwidth, as Neil has said already. Um, during the round of questions following the talk, we will switch the recording off. Um, and you can please either raise your hand. I'll try to keep control of who's raising his hand or her hand, uh, or write questions into the chat, uh, which I will then sort and organize to Daniela. And with that, I'd like to uh, give the microphone to Daniela. Okay, thank you very much. I hope my connection keeps up during this time because as you all, we, all my family is working online, somebody teaches, somebody studying, <laughs> we are under stress. So thank you for this introduction and I thank you very much to organize, to having organized this uh, series of seminars that are so important for us to keep connected and keep discussing about our science. And uh, just to correct you that Enrico Bonatti is my co-author, it, uh, it's better say that I am the co-author of Enrico Bonatti because uh, everything that comes out from the Vima Fractal Zone comes from the, the, the vision of Enrico studying and working on the temporal evolution of the oceanic crust. Uh, and uh, so he was the, the first that has this uh, impulse to, to study what happens uh, a long time in, in, a, in, a, in a rich section. And I kept up as a student and, uh, during uh, my PhD. So um, just to, to, to make some, I'm sorry, because I have plenty of things here. Okay. To make things very easy, when we look at the thing and, uh, section of Mid-Ocean Ridge, uh, we know that the mantle upwelling drags up the mantle and by the compression it melts and it generates a, a, a melting region that is pretty large in size under normal thermal conditions that can range some hundred kilometers uh, as a, in base and uh, up to 80 to 100 kilometer on, on the on the on the height and uh, can then sometimes compass pass over the gannet to spin a transition and uh, may imply melting under wet condition same wet condition the normal amount of water that is lost in the in the in the mantle that is up to some 100 ppm uh, ppm of water under these conditions usually we produce a, so we produce a crust uh, accumulate crust uh, that accumulates the all the matter that has been produced in, in this big melting region and that in some way connects together and blends together to form uh, the extracted melt uh, and accumulating all the melt that is mm, extruded as basalt and intruded as gabbro plus the, the, the transfer system of the dike complex, we accumulate something like five to six kilometer uh, magmatic crust. Uh, and, uh, and this, this system works uh, more or less in a steady state, uh, unless there are some perturbation of the system like 
changes in, in the dynamics in the in the uh, spreading directions or changing in the in the main factors that are the spreading rate the temperature and the composition of the source so what happens when we move aside from during time so given often we assume this as a a near steady state, uh, uh, near steady state um, process, uh, but it is far to be a steady state process, either in space, either in time. So if we look at what we have collected along the, the mid ocean ridges, we see that our image of the um, ridge tectonics and ridge uh, magnetism is built up uh, over a sampling that is only is only focused on the on the ridge crest and this of course is comes from the limits that as soon as we go out from the ridge crest the in the oceanic crust is covered by sediments and uh, become becomes inaccessible so what we see in fact is just a frame the last frame of the evolution of the of the system during time that lasts for uh, tens to 100 million years and uh, what happens if we look at a single ridge segment and try to understand how it evolves to time so this has been done by the, the, the help of geophysics and uh, and uh, Okay, and some works are reported that the variability in times that can be observed based on gravimetry or based on the on the on the simple morphology, so the uh, the bathymetry and the and the frequency of the variability that we can observe, and uh, essentially some cycles and in the orders of two to four million years have been observed uh, uh, at the Atlantis and the Cain zone based on gravimetry and here the Vima zone that we discussed later. Uh, and uh, they appear as variability in, uh, in the crustal thickness that can be inferred by inverting the, uh, the gravimetry signal, the residual mantle bouquet anomaly. It is interesting to observe that in some cases, as to chalky reported for the uh, cane fratozone systems, the, this variability, uh, the variability in crustal thickness, does not correlate exactly with vari variations in the spreading rate. So spreading rate that is thought to be one of the major controllers of the magma production and crustal building processes uh, does not appear to be a, a major controller in this section that is uh, that is a, a slow spreading section of the mid ocean ridges. So um, other higher frequency uh, cycles have been observed uh, recently by Shinova et al in 2018 and uh, in a long section 1400 kilometers uh, long running in uh, at 36 degree north uh, uh, along the mid Atlantic ridge and uh, he observed that that a, a certain cyclicity can be derived uh, from the uh, the measured MB, RMBA and the inverted crustal thickness and these cycles are uh, uh, comprises between 350 and 950 kilo years and uh, match more or less in the lower part of the cycling that has been inferred by Ross Palatana and uh, co-workers recently along the Southeast Indian Ridge. So we observe cyclicity, variability of the crustal thickness that point to variability in the magma supply. I don't discuss here the, the tectonic part and this cyclicity that can come from the uh, onset of um, 
of uh, mm, detachment foods or long lived detachment foods that of course generate a, another order and another kind of variability of the crust and bean processes. Um, some years ago, um, there was a, a discussion introducing the possibility that uh, even, even, uh, uh, even uh, shorter or higher frequency cycles can be inferred by studying the temporal evolution uh, along the southeastern region. And this has uh, been thought to match the uh, orbital variability and the orbital periodicities introduced by, uh, uh, by the Earth movement and the sea level uh, fluctuation uh, controlled by the Milankovitch uh, uh, cycles. Recently, this has been discussed as to be possibly unlike, uh, but we can we can keep this uh, indication as uh, as the possibility of having very high frequency, very high frequency uh, um, cycles uh, in the cluster bending processes. So, looking at the mechanisms and uh, looking and distributing the periodicity in this way, we can see that. Uh, the the um, uh, apart the the possible the possible cycles um, controlled by the tidal orbital forcing and Milankovitch cycles, we have cy a cyclicity that can be controlled by mainly uh, processes that deal with the melt extraction and the compaction of the of the mantle during the melting process, having a, a, a fluid phase distributed among the a, a, a solid phase generate compaction and porosity waves and channeling. And all these processes can uh, generate a cyclicity or uh, introduce a variability in the amount of melt extracted per unit of time whatever you consider the unit of time in the, in the rich processes. So this can range from uh, about, um, about uh, tens, tens to few hundred um, uh, thousand years in cyclicity. And, and change to other mechanism for uh, a longer period variability like viscosity driven convection instability as proposed by Choublet and Mertier in 2001 and those that has, have been assumed as, as the representative of the variability or the short period variability that is observed at the Vima fracture zone or magma pulses not better explained or interpreted that can, can, can relate with both uh, in convection instabilities or uh, compaction and porosity uh, waves or shear waves uh, in the in uh, in the uh, region uh, that uh, that is subject to partial melting beneath the region. So we uh, go further to look at if we can recognize some some longer cycles or other kind of cycles uh, by using the. Um, the, the possibility that is giving us at the Vima fracture zone, uh, where we can um, we can sample a long section of um, of crust uh, that is exposed at along this transverse ridge that is clearly visible uh, in the in the in the mapping. So the, the Vima Fertuzon has been studied since, since a very long time. A lot of people, a lot of very important people work it already. And uh, for instance, this is the first map that has been produced uh, by Kizen, Gerard, and Marie Tarp in 1964. I was not even born at that time, but you see this kind of mapping is exactly the representation that we now have in a Google map with the, with the land, the, the, the continental shelf and the, the ridge. And we recognize you know, the 1520, the, the, the Marathon Mercurius group uh, of uh, fractal zone, the Vima with this transverse region, the doldrums and the doldrums uh, system. 
So here we are in the mid Atlantic region at 11 degrees north. And this is a, the map that has been produced by uh, after the cruises led by Enrico Bonatti and is mainly the work of Marco Ligi as geophysicist that produced all the, all the bathymetric data and, uh, uh, and the geophysical data that we use in this, in, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this talk. So the, the region of the Vima Fratto zone that is, is uh, around 300 kilometers long and covers and generates an offset of about uh, 20 million years is, uh, is um, merged to the south with the east uh, mid-Atlantic ridge and uh, the western mid-Atlantic ridge. And the, the eastern mid-Atlantic ridge shows a second order discontinuity uh, that generates, generates a flexion and that is visible all along the evolution of this of this uh, stretch. For the first uh, 10 million years of crust, um, a, of crust we can observe a, a pretty normal spreading system with the abyssal fabrics closely parallel to the, to the spreading axis. And uh, at about 10 million years, we start observing this transverse ridge that is more or less parallel to the diffractor zone, but has a curved shape and becomes shallower going away from the, from the transverse ridge. This is exactly the transverse ridge that we will we use for sampling and we and uh, we discussed today. Here there are a couple of papers that you, you can consult to, uh, to to see a better and more deep description of the morphology of the of the Vima system and transverse ridge. So I don't I don't dedicate too much time to this. Uh, so the transit ridge was originated in one shot in a very short period. And this is confirmed even by dating of the carbonated and encrusted transit ridge that gives us a, a, a single age of 10 to 12 million years all along the transit ridge, attesting for a short time period or period in which it was uplifted. And the uplift follows a rapid rotation, counterclockwise rotation of the uh, poles uh, of the plates involved and the rotation in counterclockwise direction induced a, a short a rapid trans tension over, over the transform fold and the trans tension released immediately elastically the transverse ridge that, that raise up in a very short time with an uplift rate of uh, one to two million millimeter per year. So then the, the transverse ridge has been drafted away by the plate spreading and arrive in the, in the position that we observe today at 10 million years, starting at 10 million years from now. So looking to the, um, the seismic section that has have been uh, have been run across the transverse ridge, we can appreciate immediately that that the the nature of the transverse ridge is uh, strongly asymmetric, and uh, the basaltic layer can be formed continuously on the southern side, and we observe the bending of this basaltic layer, while on the northern side there is a, a system of folds. Uh, that uh, unroof um, a complete section of the of the uh, oceanic crust, and this can has been redrawn by, by Marco Lige in this romantic picture, but very nice that shows how the uh, the basaltic layer and all the layers of the uh, oceanic crust are uplifted, bent up, up, upward. So we have the basalt, the, the, the dike complex, the cabros, and the mantle section at the base. So this uplift, it's asymmetric uplift, elastic uplift, exposes and the, the, the section, the complete section of the, of the, um, of the oceanic crust and this can be followed all along, all along the base 
all along the, 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 this section that we have called uh, the Vima lithospheric section. So this is another view and uh, we, we observe where the, the um, transverse ridge starts and raises up. And uh, during time, during several cruises, a, a number of a number of sampling have been done on the base of this uh, of this uh, ridge, recovering mantle rocks every time that that dredging uh, has been done below four thousand meters below sea level. What is important is that in nineteen eighty eight uh, there there has been an um, um, an expedition uh, led by the French uh, with using the Nautil, and uh, they they run several several dives all along the, the scarp and uh, observing directly the, the sequence of units uh, starting with the periodotite at the base, then the gabbros, and then the dye complex at the basalts of the top. These are units that that are a few hundred meters in thickness. And um, even though the thickness is not exactly representative of the, the real thickness of the, of the units, because it is dissected, several folds dissect, dissect the, the units uh, and uh, disrupt exactly the, 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 original, the original position of, uh, of the boundaries between the units. For instance, Gabroic section is really underrepresented in, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, complete session. Anyway, adding dredging all along this, uh, all along this uh, section allowed us to recover every time mantopridotides and basalts and a lot of gabbros, in fact. So we had the possibility for each, for each, uh, um, for each side, sample side, to compare the composition of the basalts and the composition, the composition of the residual mantle periodotides and uh, try to infer what happens uh, when there is a fluctuation in time and in the cluster bending processes or the melting processes and what happens separately to the, to the basalt with respect to, to, the, to the mantle residue. So we will have a look at the influence of the, 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 the main controlling parameter, temperature spreading rate and so-called source composition on the temporal evolution of the mantle melting. We will check the thermal effects of melting at the heterogeneous mantle sources. And we say some words on the style of melting, open versus fractional melting through time. And then we, will upscale, try to see if there is a possibility to upscale to the rich landscape. So the first consideration is that um, using the residual mantle bouquet anomaly and inverting it to, to infer the, the crustal thickness, and we can observe that the crustal thickness has, has a fluctuation through time and uh, uh, that, that uh, is represented by representing these three to four million year cycles as, as in further discussed by Enrico Bonatti in 2003. But what is very important to me to point out now is that, that it, there is an apparent increase of the crustal thickness to time. So if we assume, we look at zero age, the, 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 the crustal section in the first 5 million years averages more or less 5.2 kilometers plus or minus 0 0.2, while in the, in the farther section, the crustal thickness averages 4.8 4 is a little bit uh, uh, thinner. And, and this seems to increase through time. If we look at the first indicator of the degree of melting that we can derive from the mantle section, uh, uh, notably the spin and chromium number, 
uh, that give us a, a first, a first uh, approximation of the degree of melting of the mantle. We observe that this, that spinal column number also increases through time. So apparently there is a coherence in the increase of the degree of melting through time and the increase of the, the crustal thickness through time. And this goes in, in the right direction apparently, and we will see that is a little bit more complicated than that. But let's try to, to discuss and to see what is the influence or what is causing this increase of crustal thickness and increase of degree of melting through time in this section that is uh, about 26 million year long uh, in, along the Vima, the, the Vima uh, section. So there are three parameters important that we can consider, the spreading rate, the mantle potential temperature, and the source composition. So concerning the spreading rate, uh, we can estimate the spreading rate by based on the, on the models of Candy and Candy Kent, 1988 and 1995. And, and it, we can um, derive that the, the spreading rate is slowly decreasing through time. So between beyond 19 million years, the spreading rate was 17.2 million years, then decreasing to 16. now, and now the spreading rate is around 14 millimeters per year. So this is not a strong decrease in spreading rate, but it's pretty sensible because we are in the slow spreading, in the slow part of the spreading rates where small variation in the spreading rate have, have dramatic effect on the amount of melt that, that is being produced. The problem is that, that if we decrease the spreading rate, uh, we expect a decrease in, uh, in the degree of melting um, by about 1% and not an increase as we observe. And uh, this decrease, whatever model we, we assume, either a passive uh, amount of flow model or a buy and flow, uh, we expect a decrease more stronger in the passive flow model or, or less, less important with the buy and flow, but uh, we expect the decrease and not, in, and not an increase in the, in the degree of melting. So spreading rate is not responsible for the observed, for the observed increase in the, in the degree of melting and the crustal thickness. What about the mantle potential temperature? I would discuss this by using, by comparing what happens in the residual mantle and in the, in, in the associated basalts. And why we observe a variability, an increase of the common number in the, in the mantle predatized, that means an increase of the degree of melting experience, the partial degree of melting experienced by the mantle predatized. When we look at the basalts uh, and, and we use, uh, we can use another other indicators such for instance, the sodium mate, sodium mate that measures the the dilution of sodium, the progressive dilution of sodium during the increase of the degree of melting of the mantle, we observe that we obtain two, two parallel, more or less parallel uh, distribution. The, the variability of the degree of the sodium mate is not very strong, but, but, but the, the, the basalts, uh, the older basalts have something lower sodium mate uh, than the present day basalts. The problem with that is that the sodium aid measuring the dilution says that, that as much as you increase the degree of melting, you more and more dilute the sodium in the, in the basalt. So the lower, value, lower values of sodium aid means higher degree of melting and higher values means lower agreements. And so if we invert these two signals, uh, the, the spinal chromium number and the, the basalt sodium made to, to a relative <coughs> degree of melting, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> and we compare them, we obtain 
two contrasting signals like that, that diverge in time. So the degree of melting inferred by the basalts decreased slightly during time. And, uh, and the degree of melting inferred by the periodotites <clears throat> increased during time. And they reach more or less the same value in now and near the zero age, even though we don't have exactly very fresh mantle periodotite from here. Also because the mantle periodotites that generate these basalts that are wrapped now are still buried in the <clears throat> mantle and beneath the crust and, and that are still upwelling there. So <clears throat> what happens here? Here, we can for sure rule out the effect of the potential temperature in generating this, this uh, discrepancy, because if we increase the temperature of the mantle, we increase the degree of melting of the, the mantle, and we expect to observe an increase of the degree of melting of the associated basalt. So there is no reason, because <clears throat> no reason why we heat up the mantle and we obtain two different degrees of melting from the extracted basalt and the uh, predetected that generate this, this basalt. We can have some more indications, some further indication looking at the, the isotopic composition of the basalts. And we see that uh, these basalts here that show the highest degree of melting that are associated with mantle with low degrees of melting and indeed very scattered, much more scattered than the, than the younger one. As a, in, and a, this basalt, they have a more enriched, isotopically enriched signal associated to uh, uh, their high degree of melting. The present day basalts, uh, they have a, a more depleted uh, Neodymium composition, and this depleted neodymium composition arrives when the basalts and the mantle they reach the same degrees of melting or a projection of the same degrees of melting. So we are um, induced to look at the, the source composition as a possible uh, um, as a possible reason for this discrepancy that we observe in the mantle versus the Basalts. And uh, we, I asked myself this question, and I said to you this question: What, what is the cause of this, uh, of this um, discrepancy that we observe? Or in other ways, uh, the other way around: When a mantle source melts, does basalts and residual mantle record the same degree of melting? So or let's say we take a mantle source and we melt 10% and then we have a basalt and we have a residual mantle and we measure and we try to infer a degree of melting from these two components. Do we measure exactly 10% if we melt at 10%? It seems a silly question, but the answer is not so easy and comes from the thermodynamics and they've been modeled by since 1984 by Norman Sleep and then developed them in a more complex way by Phipps Morgan in 2001 and Katz and Grouge in 2011. So the problem is that if we have an heterogeneous mantle that contains some low solidus lithology, dispersed meat, the low solidus lithology melt first and start to absorb the heat from the country rock, the, the mantle that contains the low solid ethology, um, proportional to the degree of melting and to the uh, latent heat of melting that is, uh, that is spent to melt the low solid ethology. So the, the, the low solid ethologies that we can define as paroxenite in general, uh, they uh, become called uh, um, called the region that absorb heat from the, the country rock. And, and the effect is that the low solidus lithology can melt till the moment that there is heat available to be sucked from the country, the country rock. And while 
the, the mantle that contains this low solid low solids lithology is uh, mm, is delayed in its in its melting because it's cooled down and uh, uh, um, and the, his degree of melting final degree of melting will be lowered by this process so then the when we consider the pooled melt uh, the pooled melt mixes uh, the melts that have been over depleted uh, over melted and generated by the melting of low solidus lithology with the melts that have been generated by melting the mantle that contains this low solidus lithology. So looking at the, the phase relationship, the answer of this question is yes, if the mantle uh, um, source is homogeneous, so I start melting at the given point and, and melting and, and at the, and when the, when the, um, the solidus reaches the top of the, of the, of the, of the curve or the melting of the temperature part. And uh, what we, I abstract is exactly what I produce in the depth. So I'm, I measure the same value in both, in both, uh, uh, in both parts. If I have an heterogeneous source, I, I cannot measure the, the, the same value because the host mantle uh, has um, melt, melt less while the, the aggregated basalts mixes in it some components that uh, comes from the over depleted uh, low melt, uh, low solidus lithology. What we observe is that with the same, the same potential temperature, we first heat the solidus of the low solidus lithology and starting melting this, we heat, we uh, cool down the mantle and the uh, low solid lithologies so that when we touch the solidus of the, of the depleted mantle, the uh, geotherm is cooler and is shallower. So we start melting later and we start melting with less heat available for melting. So if we look at in a little bit more complicated situation and we add the phase transition from garnet to spinel field, we see that the low solidus lithology uh, also keeps the garnet fingerprint till much shallower, uh, much shallower uh, depths uh, as has been well demonstrated by all experimental works why the mantle source uh, um, changes, the depleted mantle changes from the garnet to the spinal field at the higher depth. So we have at the same time a delay of the, of the uh, onset of melting of the depleted mantle and a change in the phase relationship of the system. But what I want to um, put in evidence now is that that the main man region in which the mantle source, the host mantle, uh, melts, is is strongly shrinked and uh, is shortened by the presence uh, of the low solidus lithology. And this is because because the the heat is absorbed before the mantle starts melting, and then the a cooling wave is propagated upward and uh, and causes the main melting region to stop melting uh, earlier. So as a result, we have a cool a, a cooling down of the upper part of the system and the shortening of the main melting region. So and and a, a decrease of the total amount of melt that has been produced. And we produce a thinner crust and a, a thicker lithosphere at the same time because cooler and with less melt delivered to the crust. And I don't discuss this here, but of course, this affect also the thermal state of the fracture zone that is 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 uh, sliding apart uh, uh, at, at the edges of the of the melting region. 
So we can calibrate this by making some numerical experiments and by adding uh, uh, increasing amount of low solid lithology to a, a mixed source and uh, measuring the uh, degree of melting that we obtain for the host mantle. And we see that, that adding a, a low solidus a low solidus lithology to a mixed, a mixed mantle decreases progressively the degree of melting of the mantle. And when we add the information of the crustal thickness produced, we can calibrate, calibrate uh, uh, our system in a grid that contains the degree of uh, melting uh, of experienced by the mantle, the crustal thickness, and the fraction of peroxonite that we had inside. So the two end members, the young section and the old section of the, of the VIMA section that we are consider, considering, they can be uh, modeled as having a negligible amount of peroxonites inside some few percent or a large amount of peroxonite inside the, or we reaching about 15%. Inside. So another point that we can discuss is um, what happens to the, to the, 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 um, to the uh, melting process itself. Um, does it change? We always assume that melting beneath the mid ocean ridges is near fractional, but what happens when we mix all, uh, uh, we, we are in presence of the mixed source of, of uh, uh, containing different solid, different lithologies with different solids. And this can be observed by using uh, the, for instance, in the incompatible elements in the residual clinopyroxines. Here I plot the sodium in uh, the residual clinopyroxines versus age, and we see that the sodium goes, increases significantly back in, in time. And, and the first approximation, we can say, okay, we are decreasing the, we are decreasing the degree of melt uh, that the mantle experienced during time. So we expect to have much sodium inside that, that is an incompatible element, but the amount of sodium is way too high to, to be uh, residual and cannot be modeled by a simple fractional melting. Here, for instance, if we compare the sodium content with the chromium number of the clinopyroxene, that is in equilibrium with the chromium number of the bulk rock, so it reflects very well the, the, the total degree of melting of the rock, we see that there is an enormous dispersion. This enormous dispersion cannot be modeled by fractional melting, but we can uh, only reproduce this kind of this strong dispersion with an open system melting. And, and pumping inside the system during melting some enriched melts. So these enriched melts are, have a, a sort of Garnet figure being generated with the impresses of Garnet. They bear a lot of sodium inside and, uh, and make a reaction that is also duplicated by the uh, rare elements that are, I have no time to discuss here. So anyway, these kind of trajectories are representative of open system melting. So melting in prism, something exotic coming inside the, the melting region during melting. And uh, while in approximating this end of the, of the system, we go closely to a near fractional melting. So there is a possible change in true time. If we look at the Spinel chromium number record, we see that this big dispersion here is always is frequently due to the fact that, that we have a, a bimodal distribution of the chromium number inside a single dry zone. For instance, we have a fertile periodotides associated with very depleted members. And this can tell us that, that, that there is a, a preferential dissolution in, in, the, in this places and this preferential dissolution can be driven exactly by the exotic melt passing through. And this has been well reproduced by numerical experiments and observed also on, uh, on the terrain, on the ophiolites. 
where we see that matter percolation dissolves and helps and uh, and and helps generating uh, um, preferential streamlines for mantle to percolate through the mantle, resulting in the nucleation of high porosity channels, and uh, these bear with it the presence of melts that are extremely enriched and variably enriched so that we can observe this kind of reaction between the melting mantle that is increasing in degree of melt, but is uh, experiencing the injection of very uh, enriched, enriched melts. So the solution or the, 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 the putting together all this information, we have seen that the old basalts are more enriched. They experience a lower degree. The periodotite experience lower degree of melting, and the basalts associated record a higher degree of melting. And we have here the presence of melt focusing channeling and open system melting. This agrees well with the presence of uh, low solidus lithologies dispersed in in, uh, in a mantle depleted more mantle. And while during time, this, this, this heterogeneity, the source and the decreases this effect of the uh, undercooling of the mantle. And so that the main melting region can uh, expand and, uh, and, and reach its maximum extent. When the, the amount of low solid lithologies becomes negligible, the degree of melting recorded by the two components is the same, and uh, and the uh, extent of the of the melting region reaches its maximum extent. This can explain the increase of the degree of, of the crustal thickness. And the, and the decree in the isotopic composition. So <clears throat> the implication and partial conclusions of this part is that as low spreading rates, the total melt production, that is the crustal thickness, is extremely controlled by the amount of low solidus lithologies that are dispersed inside the depleted mantle. <clears throat> These heterogeneities are oversampled during melting, and the degree of melt is, is only apparent. We cannot say in, that the basalt has recorded the true degree of melting, but only an apparent degree of melting because it mixes and blends all various components that has experienced different degrees of melting. The melting style is also affected. Channeling appears, open system appears, and, uh, the, and this depends on the amount of low solid dosis that is inside. And then we can say that this indicator, the delta F between basalts and periodotite that we have observed here, so the difference between the degree of melting estimated from the periodotites and the degree of melting estimated from the basalts is a measure of the amount of, <clears throat> of, of uh, low solid dosis dispersed in the in the in the source and requires the presence of lithologically separated uh, units uh, of low solid with low uh, uh, solidus temperature and uh, the wavelength of this variability as that we observed at the, at the VIMA is around 20 million years, but we observe only half of the, of the system because it is possible longer. So we can add something in the periodicity or the variability of the crustal uh, building processes deriving from the, 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 the mantle melting that, uh, that overlaps uh, they observe the variability at the low frequencies and, uh, and, the, and the higher frequencies and goes to up to 20 to 30 million years long in, in time. So what, what I wanted to, to, to see now, it is what can we uh, observe the same behavior along the ridge, uh, other, the mid-ocean ridges, and uh, what can we infer from that? 
And uh, I have compiled uh, only for the mid-Atlantic ridge that here yeah, I turn it by 90 degrees, the degrees of melting that we can uh, infer from the mantle rocks sampled along the mid-Atlantic ridge and the basalts sampled along the mid-Atlantic ridge. And we always observe this cut uh, that the basalts record a higher degree of melting with respect to, to the mantle rocks that are associated with the sample in the same region. That tells us that, that probably uh, we observe this cooling effect uh, everywhere along the mm -hmm. Mid-Atlantic Ridge, at least for the, the sectors that are sampled uh, um, enough to, to, to make possible a comparison between the two, the two members. The same we observe along the southwest in the ridge, but as you can see here, in some places of the southwest in the ridge, the difference between the two component, the two degrees of melting estimated is very high. And so suggest that there is a variable amount of the um, low solidus lithology dispersed in the depleted mantle, or maybe, or maybe uh, a different kind of low solidus lithology. So what we can do is trying to, to compare the, the thermal effect, so the difference between the degrees of melting with the enrichment of the basalts, because if the enrichment of the basalt correlates with the, 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 the difference in the estimated degree of melting, it means that there is, uh, the, the com there is a component that is a, a low solidus and the reach of the component that has been transferred by this mechanism to the to the basalts, and uh, that what we have seen that the female fracture zone is exactly the same process that we observe worldwide, and then hence a global process. So I made this strange um, plot that that compares the delta F between the basalts and the peridotites, and the enrichment of the basalts that are sampled in, in, a, in a single place. These, uh, these are the three sectors of the Vima, the present day and uh, the 25 million years ago section on the Vima fractal zone. And if we plot here the, 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 the places in the mid-Atlantic ridge where we can compare um, peridotite and basalts, we observe that there is a, a, a weak but, but a, a, a trend that gives uh, uh, more depleted basalts when we approach the zero difference. So going to zero means that, that we have a more homogeneous source and going away from zero, we have a more heterogeneous source or an increment of the amount of low solidus lithology. So I increase the amount of low solidus lithology. I increase the difference between the two degrees of estimated uh, uh, partial melting, and I enrich the basalts because the low solidus lithology is also uh, more enriched isotopically. And the same we observe in Southwest, but with a different, with a different slope. That means that the enriched component is different from the enriched component in the mid-Atlantic ridge, and possibly that the depleted mantle at the southwestern ridge is different from the depleted mantle in the mid-Atlantic ridge. And if we plot a global trend or the values that are being estimated during time, we see that the depleted mantle that plots zero, zero in this case, uh, uh, ranges from 5131 to 5134, and uh, is exactly in, in the prosecution of these trends that we observe here. So to conclude, uh, the in reach of components is this person in the Peter Mormon are all generated by uh, discrete lithological units because to get the difference in the estimated degree of melting means that we have thermally perturbated the system and the thermal perturbation of the system can only happen when the heat is transferred toward the, toward the low solidus lithology. And this requires a discrete lithological unit. 
And these lithologists that can approximate with pyroxenite have lower solidus with respect to the local DMM. And what about the local quantum, the crystal thickness? We don't know exactly because we don't know the exact composition of the low solidus lithology, nor the exact composition of the local depleted mantle. Okay, I added some more, more slides here to, uh, to, re to remember the other work that can be done with uh, uh, analyzing the temporal evolution, but I stop here because I see I've been too long. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, there's a lot of applause for you, so sorry for not being able to, to give that to you. Thank you very much, Daniela, for this very exciting talk, introducing us to the melting processes of mid-ocean ridges. Um, we've agreed to stop the recording at this stage um, to uh, not record the questions and not intimidate people. Um, <clears throat> may I 